Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Suzanne Fanning, and I'm going to be the moderator for this session. Um, I'm with Prisma Health and a member of the SCOS board. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our um, speakers for this session. So first, we have Dr. Daniel Petrolak. Um, and he is joining us virtually um, from the, uh, I think, believe it's ASCO GU uh, session. Um, so we are going to have very up-to-date information here today. Um, he is from Yale, as I'm sure many of us in the room are, are well aware. Uh, we also have Dr. Shernivas, and she is joining us from Stanford. Um, so thank you very much for being with us, um, and I'm going to pass things over to Dr. Love. Before we start getting into your chalk talks and kind of reviewing where we are with these three, other three uh, things, just a touch base about what was presented, uh, what is being presented there right now. Dan, uh, what I'm hearing the most about, even it was commented on in the breath session by Dr. Burstein, is more data with PARP uh, combined with hormones, uh, which is what we saw last year with both niraparib. Uh, as well as olaparib, now we're seeing telozoparib. It looks like what was seen with the olaparib trial. Any uh, comment there? That seems like a really important study. You know, I, I think it's a very important study, and I think also what we're seeing is the same pattern, that, that the deepest responses and the deepest benefits seems to be from those patients who are BRCA2, and, uh, but, but also the concept of giving HRD-negative patients this combination, I think, is 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 very very interesting. May broaden out the use of PARP inhibitors, um, <clears throat> but the real question is: is how applicable is this, is this going to be? Since a lot of our patients are already on next generation and androgens, and these trials were for patients naive to that type of treatment. So yeah, we'll get into that more when we get to prostate cancer because it really is controversial about what you do about it. Oncologists see BRCA, they think PARP, but you can't always necessarily find data to support it. And yeah, let's uh, start out talking about bladder cancer. A lot going in there. Five lines of therapy, approving metastatic disease. Dan, really a poster child for the new oncology. Maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the key data sets that have come out, including this week. So uh, the, I think the exciting data that came out was with infortimab and pembrolizumab. Uh, there was some uh, response data that was presented, which broke it up based upon visceral disease, non-visceral disease, demonstrating that the responses are very, very consistent. A half of patients with liver metastases will respond to this combination. It's a little better than fortimab alone, but I think what the, the beauty of this combination is in the duration of, of, of overall response. And we have a, a large randomized trial, EV302, which will hopefully confirm uh, the uh, the high response rate and the survival observed in the first cohort of EV103. So I'm excited about that. We also saw some new data presented on sasituzumab, uh, looking at uh, uh, platinum ineligible patients and showing a 32% response rate. So there was some exciting data uh, from some of our newer drugs. Okay, question one. What role, if any, do you believe TAR-200 will eventually play in the management of urothelial bladder cancer? If the strategy is available today, which patients would in with UBC would you prioritize its use? So this is a cartoon of of TAR two hundred. Uh, it's uh, basically a pressel, as it's called, uh, which delivers gemcitabine uh, locally to the tumors. It's a localized treatment. Gemcitabine is not uh, does not cross the uh, your ethelium into the bloodstream, so it's it's very very well contained. This is the schema from the phase one study that was performed uh, with this particular drug, basically administering this uh, between day six and, and and day eleven, and then re-administering it again. And uh, the data that's been seen with this, uh, in there are two different arms looking at different. Uh, uh, quantities of disease. Arm one with the patients with a minimal residual tumor after TUR, uh, uh, PT of greater than three centimeters. The second arm were the smaller tumors. And then there was also, uh, the, also these patients underwent a radical cystectomy after they had the insertion of the, the, the pretzel. Four of 10 patients demonstrated pathologic downstaging. One demonstrated path, a, a pathologic complete response. Three had a partial response. And then for the smaller volume tumors, eight out of 10, uh, six out of 10 had downstaging with three experiencing a partial response. And as I mentioned before, there's no systemic absorption of gemcitabine. 
So where do I see this particular agent being used? Uh, clearly, if it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, uh, but the blood, excuse me, the blood uh, bladder barrier, uh, there's no systemic absorption, uh, and you're not treating micrometastatic disease. You would have to combine it with some other agent. There is a trial that's looking at this with the uh, Janssen checkpoint. Sunrise One is looking at TART 200 in convalescent with cetrolizumab, which is a checkpoint inhibitor, um, and compared to TART uh, TART 200 alone, this is in high risk non muscle invasive bladder cancer. And Sunrise Two is also valuing this in combination with cetrolizumab versus concurrent chemo radiation therapy in patients with muscle invasive uh, urothelial carcinoma. Question two. What are your thoughts about clinical trials combining antibody drug conjugates and immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, in metastatic urothelial bladder cancer? Which patients do you feel are best suited for this strategy? Well, uh, we know that uh, infortimab has been combined successfully with pembrolizumab in a phase one trial and subsequently a large uh, phase two expansion cohort. Uh, infortimab is given a, a, a different schedule than the FDA approved schedule, day one, day eight at 1.25 milligrams per kilogram. Additionally, you're giving uh, 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 pembrolizumab at 200 milligrams every three weeks. And as we see, the efficacy, uh, as far as the best responses are concerned, is is impressive. Uh, uh, a overall confirmed over objective response rate of seventy three percent in the first cohort, and responses were seen irrespective of PDL one status. So uh, this is the uh, waterfall plot uh, again uh, by investigator uh, assessment. Uh, high levels of PDL one do not. Uh, really correlate or low levels do not correlate with the overall response rate. So we're seeing good responses irrespective of PDO one expression. So one of the thing, important things about infortimabidotin is the, the response rates in liver and visceral metastases are consistent, 40, and in the, in the most recent update, 50% uh, at ASCO-GU. Um, there are studies that are going on in cisplatinum ineligible patients. That's where the EV103 and the cohort K came from. But 302 is a randomized trial that's comparing EV Pembro versus standard chemo and both cisplatinum eligible and ineligible patients. And um, the question is going to be, where are the results? Uh, are these going to be similar results in the cisplatinum eligible patients? I think they will be because there's really no uh, reason for that. Uh, but but certainly that's something uh, for for difference. But that's something that we need to perform perform in a randomized trial. And again, this is the updated survival data from the first cohort: a 27 month median survival, uh, a progression free survival that uh, that is approximately 12.3 uh, months. And um, so, again, I think this is where this is going to you. And, and, and really, a fairly long duration response. Uh, the median duration response uh, with median follow-up uh, has uh, not yet been reached. So that, again, I think is an impressive part of this particular data. And then the other third question in bladder cancer is how do you sequence infortimab, erdofitinib, and sasituzumab for patients with metastatic urothelial bladder cancer? Problem is we don't have randomized data to help tell us what to do. There is some data looking at uh, infortimab uh, in patients who are FGFR2 and FGR3 positive. Those are the patients that you would uh, consider for erdofitinib. There's really no difference in the um, progression-free survival that's seen uh, or the response rates that are seen with with uh, when you stratify based upon FGF status. So the FGF a positive patients will respond just as well as the negative patients uh, to infortimab. Uh, the trophy trial has been published, presented in multiple meetings. Scott DeGao presented the original public, uh, publication. And um, uh, what I think is important to note is in that original study, there were patients who had responded well to infortimab and then subsequently responded to, uh, to sasituzumab. This is a patient from our experience, had a massive lymphadenopathy, responded initially to infortimab. He was heavily pretreated, and then he went on the uh, Trophy 1 study and had a good response as well. So again, uh, there there is no reason to think that these drugs are cross-resistant. Um, in fact, they have different targets and they have different uh, 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 payloads. And as I mentioned before, no randomized data comparing uh, outcomes or sequence. And the way I look at selection is based upon efficacy, toxicities, and of course, route of administration, because some patients would perform an oral agent. A patient who has 
peripheral neuropathy. It may not be the best candidate for fortimab. Additionally, the same thing is seen in those patients who have diabetes, maybe not well controlled. That's not an, an ideal patient for fortimab as well. So uh, before we uh, go back to uh, Suzanne and see what kind of questions we have in the room, I just want to bring up a couple of things that actually came up last night, Sandy, in a couple of cases that were presented by community-based oncologists that were pretty interesting. Uh, so the first was a patient who was thought to be not only cisplatinum ineligible, but just chemo ineligible. Patient with metastatic disease, performance status of two. So one of the questions I'm going to ask you in a second, Sandy, is practically, clinically, how do you define uh, cisplatinum eligibility and chemo eligibility? This patient was thought to be ineligible for neither. And interestingly, he managed to get, the doc actually managed to get Enfortimab and Pembro paid for, and that's what he treated the patient with. And everybody on the faculty sort of took a deep breath and said, whoa. But on the other hand, you know, I pointed out the fact that in a way he was kind of really just getting the next two therapies that he would have gotten anyhow. So maybe it wasn't that radical. But anyhow, just curious, Sandy, about uh, how you approach, you know, you see a lot of older uh, patients with comorbidities. Uh, and if you could, would you be using uh, this combination, this exciting combination that Dan just talked about of uh, IO, uh, you know, plus uh, and Fortimab? So cisplatinum uh, ineligibility is fairly straightforward. You know, you need to have a good renal function defined as a creatinine clearance greater than 60. We give a lot of hydration with cisplatinum. So we want people to have an adequate uh, cardiac function and you want to have them not have neuropathy and hearing loss. So these are the main criteria for cisplatinum ineligible. You could give carboplatinum, and carboplatinum eligibility would be for patients whose GFR is somewhere between 30 and 60. So that's if you if you go below that and you have a poor performance status, that's truly what chemo ineligibility is. And today for those patients, you know, I think the standard would be to consider giving them pembrolizumab as a single agent. I'm surprised that uh, EV plus Pembro was used and approved. Um, EV has been, most of the trials done with EV have looked at a creatinine clearance greater than 30. Um, how the, uh, once it gets approved, where I would use it is, I think the biggest asset for this combination is its rapid duration of response. So if somebody is symptomatic with a large liver burden, I think using uh, EV plus Pembro would be a very reasonable choice. We also have carboplatinum gemcite been followed by AVI maintenance for patients who are cis ineligible. So that's a, a great point. Uh, Dan, I'll ask you in a second, but I want to just bring in another controversial case last night that also got the faculty like, whoa, which was one of the docs again presented a patient who'd gotten uh, chemo uh, and a Valumab uh, in terms of uh, first line therapy, uh, then had progressive disease, FGFR negative. And the doc gave the patient sasituzumab rather than enfortimab, which is what I hear all of you saying, use enfortimab first when you're using an ADC. And she goes, well, you know, I've given a lot of sasituzumab in breast cancer. I've given it to a couple of patients with bladder. It's very well tolerated. I've given enfortimab. I've seen side effects. So I, I use sasituzumab first. And of course, the faculty, you know, was like, oh, well, there's better data with enfortimab. But Anyhow, these practical issues come up. Dan, any thoughts about these two cases? Well, I mean, I think the first case, I mean, I've actually gotten Fortimab Pembro approved for some patients who've requested it, and it's not been any any difficulty. You just, as you're saying, you're just giving both drugs at the same time. They're both FDA approved for, for, for bladder cancer. So I, I don't think it's that much of a shocker, particularly in the visceral disease patients. That's where we really see the biggest difference. And I, and I think that that's what's going to drive the survival benefit uh, in favor of EV Pembro in the EV302 study. So uh, I think that that's one point, but the Sasituz, my point is a very, very interesting one because this drug is already in the hands of the breast cancer docs and it's out in the community, whereas in Fortimab is only approved in your ethelial carcinoma. You have to be very, very diligent about monitoring neuropathy and skin rash. And so perhaps 
you know, it, it's an easier drug in somebody who has the experience with sastuzumab and breast cancer. And as I mentioned before, there is no cross resistance, at least theoretically there isn't. And in our experience in Yale, when we've looked back at our data, it's still the same similar response rates one way or the other. So uh, it, the question of sequencing if it's going to come down to biological markers, which we don't have at this point. So I'll turn it back to Suzanne and see if she has any questions. Just to point out that the idea of an IO plus uh, chemo, we're, later on when we talk about our lymphoma session, first-line therapy, Hodgkin lymphoma, brentuximab plus chemo, first-line therapy, diffuse large B-cell that's being certainly looked at, POLA plus uh, our chemo. So it's certainly not a new concept. Suzanne, any questions that you have about uh, bladder cancer or the audience there? Yep, we don't have anything from the audience just yet, but I, as we talk about EV and Pembro, you mentioned um, the creatinine clearance of 30 for EV. Um, you also talked about diabetes and peripheral neuropathy. Um, are there any other populations that you are leery or steering away from this combination? Any other comorbid conditions? Uh, the only one I would think of is obesity. You have to be very careful with, with blood counts in those patients. That's the, Those patients I've got into trouble with, and that also, of course, would be precipitating, uh, perhaps precipitating diabetes as well if it, or worsening it. So I think that's the only other situation I would be, 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 be very vigilant with. One other issue that came up last night, um, you know, it's amazing for docs in practice, a lot of them haven't used these drugs, eritafitinib, for example, I'm curious, uh, Dan, uh, what do you say to a patient or what do you think about when you're about to start a patient on ertafitinib in terms of the phosphate lever, in terms of side effects? What are some of the things that you're thinking about when you start a patient on this drug, Dan? So ertafitinib, I would say it's, 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 a, it's something like in Fortinab. You've got to monitor the patient carefully. Fatigue is a big problem. They have to have retinal exams because of the risk of central serous retinopathy. Uh, so you have to make sure that you good to get a good visual history. You've got to work with an ophthalmologist with this particular drug as well. So it's a little bit more complex than using the other agents. But nonetheless, you know, the response rate of vertifitinib is about 40% in the FGFR3 positive patients. The trouble is finding an FGFR3 positive patient because they're pretty, they're, they're not as common as I think people thought they were at the beginning. So let's move on to talk about prostate cancer. And Sandy, so just as in when we're talking about breast cancer, how much is going on right now with the endocrine therapy? A lot going on with hormonal therapy of prostate cancer as well. We ask you to review that, please. So the question that was posed here is, what is your current approach to endocrine therapy for locally advanced prostate cancer in addition to radiation? The, uh, for patients who choose to have radiation as their primary treatment, as opposed to a radical prostatectomy, the guidelines are fairly clear and straightforward about the use of ADT. So NCCN divides these patients into low risk, intermediate, high risk, and very high risk. So we know that for those patients with very low risk and favorable intermediate risk, the addition of uh, androgen deprivation therapy really hasn't added much, if any, may contribute more to the cardiac mortality. But for patients with intermediate unfavorable risk, the guidelines are clear about using short-term androgen deprivation therapy which is typically defined as about six months of treatment. And for patients with high risk, randomized trials from RTOG uh, groups have shown that you need long-term androgen deprivation. And that's defined as anything as 1.5 years to about three years of ADT. Now, more recent data from the STAMPI trial have demonstrated that for patients with very high risk disease, that ADT intensification with Abby for about a year and a half to two would be appropriate. And the same also applies to patients who have clinical node positive disease. So this is in the primary setting where I think the guidelines are fairly straightforward. And this is what we use in clinic. For patients who have a radical prostatectomy and who are requiring salvage radiation, I think there's more controversy here 
It's a little unclear how much of uh, hormones to use, which hormones to use. And I think we have a lot of studies here trying to help us. The standard of care would be six months for all comers based on the GITAG-16 trial. But there's a lot of controversy because we, based on PSMA imaging, based on very early start of radiation. So we now radiate patients with the PSA of 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So maybe for those patients who have have a very low PSA, no hormonal therapy is needed. On the other hand, uh, trials such as the radicals have suggested that patients should get two years of ADT. I think it's a very, um, it's an, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, a phase where we have a lot of controversy and there may be over-treatment and under-treatment. So there are a lot of strategies to escalate <coughs> and to de-escalate, even based on genomic testing such as Decipher. So really looking forward to these studies to help guide what the appropriate use of hormonal therapy would be in patients undergoing radiation in the salvage setting. So the next question that were that we were asked to address is we have many ARIs, so androgen receptor antagonists such as enzalutamide, apalutamide, and daralutamide, all FDA approved in the non-metastatic CRPC. How do you select among these three drugs? And has Abby been studied in this setting? So here are the three large drugs. <coughs> so all of these trials were in the non-metastatic CRPC, which was defined by conventional imaging. These patients were then randomized to ADT plus one of the ARIs. So in the PROSPER trial, it was to enzalutamide, in the Spartan trial to apalutamide, and in the Aramis trial to daralutamide. All three trials had very similar design, and their primary endpoint was metastasis-free survival and all three trials met their endpoint and also had improvement with OS and improvement in quality of life. So when you have three drugs which have very similar efficacy, how do you then look to pick what drug you choose? I think the next step would be going into safety and looking at their tolerability. So drug discontinuation is a good surrogate for safety. And if you look at the adverse events leading to discontinuation, continuation in these trials. You can see that for uh, enzalutamide, it was around 18% for PROSPER, uh, in the enzalutamide trial, around 18%. For uh, apalutamide, around 15 It looks like daralutamide may have better tolerability with the discontinuation rate being 89 And some of the side effects that we commonly see, such as fatigue, fall, fractures, all seem to be lesser with less CNS penetration for daralutamide. So overall, I think all three drugs are uh, appropriate. It does seem like perhaps daralutamide might have a slightly uh, better safety profile. Finally, for the question about Abby, you know, we think about these drugs being very similar. Um, they, the three drugs, uh, APA, APA, DARA, and ENZA, block the androgen receptor, while Abby is an androgen synthesis inhibitor. In this uh, setting, we don't have level one evidence. There was a small single arm trial that looked at 130 patients, and they showed that the PSA response was very similar to the other ARIs, but it's not made it to NCCN guidelines because we really don't have level one evidence for that. The next question really was, you know, moving on to the metastatic hormone sensitive space. We have so many options and how do we pick in the clinic? Do we do it based on volume? Do we do it based on symptoms? My overall take is that ADT is the backbone for hormone sensitive prostate cancer. And then in the um, late 1990s, the addition of docetaxel to ADT sort of changed the standard of care. And we now know that doublets, either with DOSI or Abby, improved overall survival. 
there was a lot of debate whether you use Dosi or Abby. And the next generation of trials that came on looked at the ARI, such as apalutamide and enzalutamide. Based on these trials, we know that ADT alone is inadequate for most patients, and you should offer patients a doublet. ADT plus DOSI or ADT plus one of the uh, ARSI. It could be ABI, it could be ENZA, or it could be APA. And as we were getting comfortable with doublet in the last year, we have had triplets now in this space. These triplet trials are slightly different where they look at a backbone of ADT and DOSI taxol, and they either ask the question about does the addition of ABI or APA daralutamide make a difference. And clearly triplet resulted in improvement in overall survival compared to doublet. So how do you select? I think volume matters. Patients with high volume disease clearly seem to derive a benefit from docetaxel. And there's also significant heterogeneity in this disease. Patients with de novo disease have a worse outcome compared to your patient who's had a radical prostatectomy and then has a slow rise in PSA and eventually develops metastatic disease. The overall survival between these two groups are remarkably different. You look at chemo fitness like we always do in any disease. You look at frailty, you look at comorbidities. Hypertension is common with many of these drugs. Our patients on four different blood pressure medicines. What is their support at home? What is their cardiac health? I think as we have multiple choices, all of these factors are going to come in. I've listed up here the, um, there are now nine randomized trials in this space, looking at more than thousands and thousands of patients, all demonstrating that ADT alone is not adequate and you need ADT intensification. So my sense is that you can look at the hazard ratio, they all uh, have an improvement in overall survival with ADT intensification. So if I see a patient who has de novo high volume disease, who's chemo fit, I would employ either piece one or Aracens and pick the triplet. But otherwise, for most of my patients with newly with uh, metastatic hormone sensitive disease, I'm going to be picking an ADT doublet whatever drug that I'm comfortable with, and uh, to be able to give patient that ADT intensification. So a couple questions for Dan, and then we'll let uh, Sandy continue with sort of part two of prostate. Uh, Dan, a question from the uh, chat room, uh, Ishmael, is there a, still a role for CIP-T? Yes, there is, um, and, and that's metastatic castration resistant disease. Uh, so this is we're talking more about hormone sensitive. But there is still a role. Uh, it does improve survival by about four months. Generally, this should be for those patients who have low volume disease. The patients who have PSAs less than twenty two tend to benefit more. They should not have visceral disease as well. So it's a, as a first <coughs> treatment at, at castration resistant relapse. That's I think the place to use it. So another very simple question, uh, Dan, you hear a lot of people talking about the triplets, uh, Aracens. Do we have any data that docetaxel adds anything to ADT plus novel horm hormonal therapy? Well, yes, we have the, uh, the so we, we don't have, unfortunately, we don't have a randomized trial that can really, you would need a three-arm study that compares monotherapy with an antiandrogen to triplet therapy with docetaxel to docetaxel alone. So that that really would be the conclusive proof. But Kareem Fazazi actually showed a very nice little bar graph showing the in, in, increments in overall survival. And, and clearly, the, the longest improvement in survival comes from uh, the PEACE-1 study as well as the Arison study. So, so these patients are still surviving longer. Whether you could achieve the same thing with sequ sequential treatment is unclear at this point. But, but it does seem at least in those particular trials, to, to those patients do better. So Suzanne, any questions in the room? Yes, we do have several. Um, so one question is, any role for docetaxel after salvage radiation? 
In the adjuvant setting, there have been three trials that have looked at uh, dosi with radiation. While there's minimal improvement in time to relapse, there's not been an established overall survival. So I would say probably for now that the use of docetaxel in that setting is not uh, hasn't gotten level one evidence. Another question is, uh, or more of a comment, but shouldn't all chemo-eligible patients get triplet therapy for castrate-sensitive metastatic disease as most will recur? I think uh, we are now beginning to understand that volume of disease matters. If you look in all of these trials, consistently patients with high volume disease have a higher benefit from chemotherapy and the triplet. So maybe it is an over-treatment for patients with low volume disease to get chemotherapy, and they may just do well with ADT with an uh, AR ARSI. Mm -hmm. And also, you have to remember, too, that there is a difference between de novo versus uh, progressive disease after local therapy. That That's a very, very different group of patients. The de, de, de novo metastatics do much, much worse. Why don't we let uh, Sandy uh, continue on now with the rest of her uh, slides on prostate? So I think we move on now to uh, metastatic CRPC. And the question really was with the approval of lutetium-177 PSMA-617, where would that fit for patients with um, CRPC? And really just a little bit on uh, Pluvicto or lutetium-177. So this was the vision study, and it took patients with really refractory disease. These were patients who had had two prior ARSI. 50% of the patients even had two prior taxanes, both docetaxel and cabazitaxel, and they were randomized to either the lutetium-177 with best supportive care versus best supportive care. And the best supportive care was um, pre-specified. It could not be chemotherapy. It couldn't be immunotherapy. Um, so that was the design. The trial had alternate endpoints looking at RPFS and OS, and either one were sufficient to call it a positive study. And the trial had to have patients had to come in who had a PSMA positive scan. The trial met its endpoint. There was improvement in longevity with an improvement in OS favoring the lutetium um, 177. You can see that there was an improvement in a radiographic response um, compared to patients in best supportive care and the waterfall plot showing you the PSA 50 response at around 50% and patients having a PSA greater than 80% in about a third. So definitely an active drug. And this has um, the side effects that we tell our patients who, who undergo this agent is mostly fatigue happens in about half of the patients. There is bone marrow suppression in about a half. But if you look at grade three, grade four, that's in single digit numbers. There is some PSMA uptake in salivary glands. So it's not uncommon to have dry mouth with this disease and some very minimum GI toxicity. So my sense by participating in the vision trial, overall, it's really well tolerated, I would say definitely easier than chemotherapy with some different side effects. Where will this fit? So NCCN has um, lutetium-177 in the metastatic CRPC for patients who have received prior ARSI and chemotherapy. There was this press release that came out in December looking at PSMA-4, which is using this drug in the pre-chemotherapy space. So we know that this trial met its endpoint. We haven't seen the data, but certainly this allows us to offer uh, PSM, lutetium-177 to patients in the metastatic CRPC space, pre-chemotherapy pre or pre-docetaxel. I think the last question was um, the most a controversial topic even for this year, looking at germline 
and uh, PARP inhibitors in prostate cancer. We know that we have, um, first of all, a little bit on testing. Who needs testing? I would say that all patients who are newly diagnosed with metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer deserves germline testing. And traditionally, we have been doing uh, somatic testing in patients in the metastatic CRPC space, because that's where we have had two monotherapy PARP inhibitors approved. So Olaparib was approved based on the profound study in the pre-docetaxel space, and Rucaparib was approved based on Triton 2 in patients who had received an NHT as well as docetaxel. So this is where, till you test, you don't know. So for sure, recommendations to do testing, somatic and germline testing in patients with CRPC. Many of our patients, I think tissue testing is preferred, but if you don't have tissue testing, then doing blood testing, looking for liquid biopsies. Now, last year, what was more controversial was that there were several trials, three, two trials, Magnitude and Propel, which now looked at the combination with Abby with these PARP inhibitors. So Magnitude looked at Niraparib and Propel looked at Olaparib. And the interesting thing about this trial was that they looked at all comers. So Propel looked at all comers. And in that trial, they had 20% who were HRRM positive. This year at ASCO, just yesterday, we had a Triton 2, uh, sorry, Talapro 2, which looks at another PARP inhibitor, talisoparib, with enzalutamide. So again, there's some rationale to combine PARPs with these AR drugs, which may promote increased DNA uh, repair. And it's really fascinating. It's a little unclear whether we should be offering this combination to all patients. All of these trials were studied in the first line CRPC in patients who are naive to these NHTs. Today, the practice has really changed. As we saw in some of our hormone sensitive space, many of us are using ADT intensification. So in my practice, I really don't have this population who's coming to castrate resistance without having seen an NHD. Much of the benefit from this is coming from BRCA mutation. So if you look at the hazard ratio, for all comers, the hazard ratio is in the 0 0.6. For patients with um, HRR mutations, it's down to 0 0.4. But if you look at patients who are BRCA mutated in the PROPEL trial, the hazard ratio is 0 0.18 for RPFS. So we really believe that BRCA is really driving much of this benefit. And the other thing that we really think we should wait for is overall survival. It's a little unclear whether this huge RPFS is going to translate into overall survival. So my take today is, I think these are incredibly provocative studies. We want to, if I see a patient who has never had an NHT and who's at first line CRPC, if they are BRCA positive, I think I'll have no reservation combining an NHT with a PARP inhibitor. For the other patients, I think I'm going to wait till I see more data, especially looking at OS. So uh, where do we begin? So much to talk about, but let's start at the last point. And Dan, I'm curious about your thoughts about the new study with Telozopra, which seems to mirror what was seen in the Propel study. So two, two practical questions. Of course, we can only go with the data that we have, but I am curious uh, if you know that you have a patient with a BRCA, for example, BRCA2, pretty common in uh, prostate cancer, you know that you have a patient to start with from the very beginning Ideally, when would you want to bring in a PARP inhibitor? Do you have any preference about which one? When can you do it right now based on the data that we have? And then, of course, the big question that Sandy alluded to was what about these patients without BRCA? Do you think it's, you know, now you have two studies showing a benefit. You saw the same thing with ovary. We'll talk about that later. 
So, Dan, where are we now and where are we heading in terms of PARP and prostate? This is a very, very complex question. I, I mean, I think it's it's provocative, and I think there are a lot of ways we can go with this. But I, I think I agree with Sandy that if I have a patient who's BRCA1, BRCA2, that they, they come in uh, naive, uh, that I will con- con- consider strongly g- giving both a uh, novel hormonal agent along with a PARP inhibitor. I've had the most experience with Olaparib. That's the one I've used the longest. Uh, Olaparib is approved for basically a a large gamut of DNA repair mutations. Uh, it's also approved in patients right after uh, next, uh, next novel hormonal agents. Rucaparib has a little bit more of a narrow uh, approval uh, indication at this point. They've had to have failed docetaxel as well as a novel hormonal agent. Now, I, I think the real interesting question that's going to be raised here is what to do about those patients who are already on the novel hormonal agent and they're BRCA positive. Do you continue the no- novel hormonal agent and add the PARP inhibitor, or conversely, if they're not on a novel hormonal agent, they progress and they're BRCA positive. Do you add another? Do you add the novel hormonal agent to potentially overcome resistance? So, uh, so I think there are a lot of very provocative questions in terms of how to sequence these agents that come into play. The HRD negative patients, you know, I've got one trial that's that that is showing you know RPFS benefit. Actually, two. One that doesn't. Um, so. I'm a little bit less enthusiastic about it, uh, and I would wait, as as Sandy has pointed out, for the survival data. So, uh, Sandy, uh, just uh, one other question before we uh, 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 get into the issue of RCC. Maybe we'll come back to some of these other questions we're getting about prostate. But one of the issues, again, that came up in our prostate cancer symposium, one of the first cases we presented was a 96-year-old man who presents with hormone-sensitive metastatic disease. And the docs goes, you know, I'm really not thinking about giving chemo in this patient. But, you know, based on what you were saying about comparative toxicity, the doc wanted to give darolutamide. And yet, you know, it's really approved combined with uh, the taxane. Uh, the faculty's uh, view last night was that you can actually g- get uh, uh, darolutamide uh, by itself. But I'm just kind of curious. Uh, uh, the indication is with uh, chemo, Sandy, do you ever use... Uh, Darlutamide uh, alone with ADT in a patient, you know, for example, an older patient. I mean, for this patient, I think there are many choices. I think uh, I might go with um, with a monthly LHRH antagonist. You know, uh, they certainly have better. At least there's some data to suggest that they may have better cardiac toxicity profile. And rather than commit patient to a long-acting LHRH and, uh, agonist, I think one of those drugs may be reasonable. Uh, monotherapy ARIs, they do have issues with um, uh, uncontrolled estrogen stimulation, that there are issues with gynecomastia. So I think you trade one evil for another. I agree. I mean, while we are... Um, while we now have nine randomized trials telling us that ADT alone is not adequate, I think this is where some personalized medicine come in. You think about the person sitting in front of you, and at 96, if his cardiac, if his uh, mortality is going to be more from non-prostate cancer issues, I think controlling his disease with some monotherapy, be it an ARI or some LHRH antagonist, seems a very reasonable approach. So speaking of AR antagonists, one of the other topics that came up with that case and came up last night was the oral antagonist, Rilogolic. Sandy, one of the community docs was concerned about, you know, adherence it's because it's so important. Uh, have you used Relagolic, Sandy, particularly in patients with uh, high with cardiovascular histories? I've used Relagolics quite a bit. I think, uh, yes, it's a daily dosing and patients have to feel comfortable with it. There is co-payment for an oral drug compared to an injectable. But I think the biggest asset that Relagolix offers is for patients who we do intermittent androgen deprivation therapy, the recovery of testosterone is just so much faster with Relagolix compared to Lupron. So a lot of patients appreciate when you stop the drug that their recovery of testosterone is much faster. Suzanne, any questions from the room? We do. We have um, several about lutetium. Um, One is a question of, can patients be retreated, and is there any concern of secondary malignancies? 
So the vision trial allowed a total of four doses. And if patients achieved a complete response or had a great response, they didn't have to get cycle five and six. Uh, the outside of the U.S., I think there's a lot more experience like in Australia, where they have been using this for much longer than we have. There is some data about retreatment, but I think we have to sort of think about what's the uh, optimum number of cycles patients can get. On the vision study, it's a maximum of six. So whether they need all six, can we, um, for patients who are not having a benefit, could we stop without giving them all six? I think as we get this drug more in our hands, we'll understand and learn some of those. The uh, other question, I'm sorry, the so one was on retreatment and the second one was on... Any concern for secondary malignancies? I mean, I think the, these sort of agents have been around in the neuroendocrine field. So Lutathera has been around for a lot longer than Pluvicto. There are uh, reports of MDS and AML. While we have it approved in a much highly refractory population, as we move this drug in earlier lines of therapy, I think we definitely need long-term follow-up about hematologic outcomes. Another question real quick, uh, Dan, before you get into RCC. Patients with bone-only METs, what comes first, radium or lutetium? Um, that's a great question. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, I think, a question of availability also uh, because we do have a supply issue in terms of lutetium. I would prefer lutetium first. That's my own preference. It also would depend upon the PSMA scan. Uh, not everybody's going to image po positively for a PSMA, but 13% from the vision trial were, were taken, were not eligible for study based upon their PSMA scans. So I think you've got to look at the clinical situation. All right, well, let's get into RCC. We had, a, again, a symposium there, a lot of debate about first-line therapy and even second-line therapy. And that's your first question here, Dan. Terrific. So uh, what's the optimal first-line therapy for patients with metastatic renal cell carcinoma, and how does this vary based upon risk status, symptomatology, and other factors? So uh, these are some of the different trials that have been evaluated in frontline renal cell carcinoma. Uh, there's Keynote 426, Axipembro, Checkmate uh, 9ER, which is uh, a car, uh, Cabo Nevo, uh, Javelin, uh, which is Axi Evalumab, uh, Emotion, Bevacuzumab, Atezolizumab, Checkmate 214, Nevo, and Ipi, which is probably the, the longest one we have as far as follow up goes, and Cosmic 313, uh, Cabozantinib uh, combined with Nevolumab. So the one thing to point out here is that the patients with intermediate poor risk disease in uh, checkmate 214 were the ones who developed a survival benefit when compared to sinitinib as first-line therapy right now uh, in a good risk patient, sinitinib or a single agent, a TKI is something that's acceptable. But when we look at the different survivals in terms of par RPFS, in terms of overall survival, all these have very, very similar uh, overall uh, uh, su survival. So there's nothing that really distinguishes one regimen as being uh, more active than the other in this particular situation. So how do I look at this in terms of the OVO picture? Well, number one, as I mentioned before, the risk of the patient. And the one I think that people are the most comfortable with is Ipinevo because there's a tail to the survival curve. It's got the longest follow-up. The survival curve is uh, tail is about 30%. Uh, the drawbacks to this particular combination, the diarrhea that can occur and the immune-related events that can occur with the combination. But if you have a patient with rapid progression, rapid visceral disease, it's been the general experience that a checkpoint plus a TKI is going to give you the most rapid response. This response is a little bit slower, so this would be a combination they would favor in this particular situation. Then sites of disease as well. If I've got a patient with bone meds, if uh, I, I'm going to favor a cabozantinib-based regimen, as we know that from cabosun, those patients who had bone meds did better uh, than uh, with cabo than they did with sunitinib. 
We also have to look at the comorbidities. I mentioned before hypertension is being, uh, uh, before diarrhea is being a comorbidity with uh, immune checkpoint inhibition, uh, more so with ipinevo, but hypertension has got to be managed, especially with the TKIs. And in some situations, in my experience, this has become refractory. So a patient who is hypertensive to begin with may not be the right patient to go with, with a TKI in this particular situation. So, so those are sort of my uh, pearls for, for, for this type of, for these particular regimens. Now, question five, we've reshuffled the deck and renal cell carcinoma now by moving the TKIs and IOs up front. Uh, what do you, how do you sequence these agents? Because really there's a lack of, of randomized data telling us what to do here. So in this trial, we, this uh, slide, we've summarized uh, what happens in with VEGF TKIs or combinations li like uh, levatinib and everolimus, uh, uh, specifically also cabozantinib, tevazimib. What are the response rates and what are the times of the PFS? There's really nothing here that stands out as being the best agent to use uh, in the situation. The response rates any range anywhere between 29 and 45% overall. Uh, PFS is again all over the place, so it's hard to tell because of their heterogeneity to patients which regimen to use. What I like to do is I like to use regimens, of course, that are potentially non-cross resistant. So if I've given a TKI such as cabozantinib, I may try uh, everolimus plus levatinib as a subsequent follow-up. Or if I've not given cabozantinib and the patient has got bone metastases, I would go with that particular agent. So again, I think what you're trying to do is tailor what you have without evidence in terms of randomized trials to the patient's overall sites of disease. So that's that's sort of my take on, on the, the sequential use of these agents. So uh, just a couple of follow-up issues. Again, uh, these things uh, came up with the cases at our uh, symposium uh, on Wednesday, and then we'll come back to Suzanne for a couple more questions, and then we'll take the lunch break. So, uh, uh, you know, one of the most common issues that came up, I think we had two cases like this, Sandy, was where patients who get started on first-line ipinevo and then have an autoimmune problem, for example, hepatitis. So first question, incidentally, is how frequently do you see that with ipinevo? And the second question is how do you manage it? And the questions we were getting from the docs in practice was, uh, do you stop both? Do you just stop? You know, a lot of people talk about just holding the ipi and keeping the nevo going. And then the other question that comes up is if you're going to do that, should you bring in a TKI like Cabo even, you know, at that point? So any thoughts about the incidence of uh, adverse autoimmune problems with ipinevo in the RCC setting, Sandy, and how do you manage it? I mean, I personally like ipinevo because unlike the IOTKIs where you have to do the song and dance as to whether the adverse event is from the TKI or whether it's from the IO, here it's fairly straightforward. If somebody has an abnormal liver enzyme, you know it's from the IO. So it really doesn't matter whether it's the EP or the nevo. Based on the grade, you would stop the hold the drug and you would start them on steroids. The likelihood of this happening, I would say, is probably about somewhere between uh, 10%. They usually happen more in the first six months. And after that, the uh, likelihood of adverse events become less and less. I do think managing uh, them with steroids has become uh, people are quite comfortable using it. So my personal preference would be ipinevo because I think you have one chance at getting a complete response and a durable response. And that's shown, as Dan said, I think we have the longest follow-up with ipinevo. And uh, if they were to have side effects, then there are many of these patients. The beauty about uh, Checkmate 214 is we have seen patients who have had their drug held they continue to have a response. So treatment-free interval, I think, is a terminology that's very applicable to the combination of EP-NEVO. So you can safely hold treatment and continue doing surveillance scans on these patients till their adverse event resolves. So the art of oncology, which means I'm going to ask Dan the same exact question. But on top of that, Dan, I'd also like you to add in your favored TKI-IO combination, putting aside the bone med issue that you brought about about the Cabo, 
But in general, again, how do you handle uh, autoimmune toxicity, for example, hepatitis with ipinevo? And then what's your favorite TKIIO combination? I mean, I think my, my, my uh, regimen is very, very similar to, to Sandy's in terms of hot handling this. Um, my, f- my favorite TKI regimen is Axipembro. I mean, I like Axipembro a lot. Um, you know, I like Cabo, uh, Cabo, TK, uh, Cabo checkpoint a lot as well. But again, I'll use that in a, an individual situation. Cabo is maybe a little bit more of a difficult drug to tolerate, uh, than, uh, than uh, the other TKIs from a fatigue standpoint. Uh, but I like Axipembro a lot. So, uh, Suzanne, any questions from the room? You maybe have some from earlier that we never got to also, I think. Um, if you have good systemic control with immunotherapy and the patient has CNS only progression, do you continue immunotherapy or switch to TKI? I think the patient needs some sort of local radiation, so cyber knife or some uh, local control. And then I think continuing uh, IO would not be unreasonable. There are now some data that cabozantinib has good CNS penetration. And even patients who have visible metastatic disease, they have had response to cabozantinib. So depending on overall tolerability and how problematic the brain lesion is, I think it would be reasonable to either continue the IO and reserve the TKI for the next recurrence. So another question, um, and I don't even do GU, but this seems like an age-old question, but are there patients with stage four disease that you still recommend nephrectomy? I think really the, the issue is delaying systemic therapy. And are these patients symptomatic from their from their kidneys? You know, the, the data is still very, very conflicting in terms of whether they should receive a nephrectomy or not. I, I generally want to get their systemic treatment in first because their metastatic disease will wind up uh, killing them rather than the local disease, again, unless it's symptomatic. Uh, but at the end, if they have residual disease and I can resect it, I will. So I sort of do it a little bit in the reverse direction. Kind of curious what you both think about belzutifan. You know, the anti-HIF agent, you know, came in, you know, uh, uh, in terms of uh, patients with hereditary syndromes. But Dan, also hearing about it in sporadic RCC, are we going to be using uh, belzutifan in sort of the typical RCC? Uh, I think, I, I, I'm just trying to recall the data right now. I think that we probably will be using it outside of those HIF, HIF patients. So, uh, so I, mean, I think that that's, that's a possibility. Sandy, any thoughts about that agent? It really seems interesting. So uh, I agree. I mean, I think we have um, um, a small phase two study looking at a highly refractory patient population. So they had more than three median therapies and overall response in uh sporadic kidney cancer was around 25%. So certainly there's a lot of interest in bringing this drug forward. So currently there are two large trials. One, in fact, looking at belzutifan in the adjuvant space. So it's a randomized trial to either pembrolizumab plus belzutifan versus pembrolizumab plus placebo. That's the uh, adjuvant study currently going on in the US. And there's also a trial looking at belzutifan with Lenvat and pembrolizumab in the front line. So definitely an active drug is going to play a role in RCC, and we'll see if moving it up forward uh, changes our first line landscape. Back to you, Suzanne. Any questions even from earlier on when we were talking about uh, prostate and bladder? Well, we have a a comment um, and looking for your thoughts on it, but it's... um, This person is stating that they have seen some profound responses in selected patients when combining carbo with cabazitaxel. Um, Do you use it and when? There's actually some good data out of MD Anderson uh, with carboplatinum and cabazitaxel. And in fact, uh, there is a trial that's going to be done in patients with visceral disease with a certain genetic phenotype in the Southwest Oncology Group. So it is an active combination, particularly in those patients with visceral disease. And then I have one more question on uh, lutetium. Um, so there's a patient with a rising PSA after four treatments. Restaging is pending. Um, do you see a PSA flare with the t- lutetium, and how would you manage this patient? 
The PSA flares typically happen early on. So I think, you know, uh, after the first cycle, we see most patients have a drop in PSA. And by cycle two, if the patient hasn't had a drop in PSA, I would worry that this patient has true progression. Might be an idea to get some sort of imaging, you know, whether it's PSMA-based imaging or some conventional imaging to determine if there is true progression. There's a pretty rapid rapid time to onset for PSA dropping with lutetium. So if you've gone four cycles and the patient still has a climbing PSA, I would worry about this being true progression. So I think with that, we're good to head off to lunch. Thank you.